Hi, welcome to another episode of Therapy and Theology. I'm Lisa Turkhurst with Dr. Joe Munmale, right? That's right. Doctor yep. now. <laughs> this is this is a new title that you worked for for a long time. So long it's exciting time. to say it. Truly. And of course, we have Jim Crest. Mm -hmm. He is a professional licensed counselor and he happens to be my counselor. And I'm so thankful for both of you and the influence you have in my life. Yeah. You know, sometimes when we experience physical trauma or a physical wounding, it's when we ask the question, how do I know if I'm healing? The physical healing is a lot more apparent. It seems to be that we can see the scab, we can see maybe that we're putting medicine on it, we can go to the doctor, and there's just a very visible reality that you know when it's healing and when it's not. Emotional wounding, emotional trauma is a lot more mysterious. And so mm -hmm. today we're answering the question, how do I know if I'm healing? So Jim, I know that over the years, you have done a lot of work with people who have been through pretty significant emotional trauma. Yeah. And so you've developed some mile markers that we can look for when it comes to healing. Now, in a previous episode, we talked about the stages of the impact mm -hmm. of a trauma hitting us. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about kind of like moving through the stages of grief, moving through those stages of the impact from a trauma. Yeah. But today we wanna to talk about mile markers of healing. How do I know if I'm healing? So a quote that I've used here before uh, on, on these therapy and theology uh, programs, videos, podcasts, I'll use again. It is from Brene Brown, and it says that you either walk inside your story, all of it, and that means your new story of the relational trauma that you've gone through, the relational pain. You either walk inside all of it. When we tend to want to orphan off parts, of like, I don't want to talk about that part. Mm -hmm. So you either walk inside your story, all of it, and embrace it, deal with it, deal with the facts and the impact of it, or you'll spend your life walking outside your story, numbed out, disconnected, whatever, and hustle for your worthiness. Just wonder, can I be worthy with God or a new person in a relationship? Mm -hmm. So doing that necessary story work, especially coming out of relational trauma, is to stop, pause, hopefully be with a good friend, maybe a therapist, a pastor, someone who can walk with you and to say, here again are the facts and the impact. I do FIT, you know, F-I-T, facts, this happened to me, impact, what did it do to me, and what track, T, what track do I want to take going forward, these mile markers, and I can share them if you want to right now. Yes. I've got about 10 of them here, and uh, you can rewind the either audio podcast or the video podcast and write these down if you want. Not necessarily in this order, but these are some of the ones that I've seen in working with people. And quite frankly, in my own life as a client, I've been in therapy for years myself working on my life. Again, one, I'll put down, address the facts and the impact of what went on. Take a good look at it, not a superficial look. Number two, identify what am I truly willing, willingness is huge, to mm -hmm. let go of. Maybe even deeper, what is God asking me to let go of here? And what will I need to release that's all through scripture, the rich young ruler at one level. I want to follow you. I want to work your plan. God says, here's what it will cost you. It's always a cost to being able to let things go in my life. Okay, so I want to touch on this Please, one. Let's so do you're it. saying that this is a sign of healing, that you get to the point where you're willing to release. Now, what are we releasing? Well, so let's release the impact of what went on. Okay. That would be one, and that is to let's release control. Mm. Another program coming up uh, we've done before, we'll do again on codependency. I want to release the idea that they got by with it. That okay. person was able to hurt me. I have to say they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've been doing some work, some theological work around this one, mm -hmm. the releasing, because you know, with therapy and theology, Joel brings the theology, Jim brings the therapy. They both actually bring a combination of both of those. And then I bring the issues, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm going to bring some issues. Now you bring a lot more than the issues. Thank you. Sometimes you bring the tissues too. Oh, Not thank the you. Yeah, and I, know, I know what it is. Actually, I figured out there's a discipline in the theological world called practical theology. And you are yeah. our practical theologian. There you go. And therapist, maybe. And Even th though I have no qualifications. Therapy. Yes, you do. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Can you, uh, can you offer like an honorary license, like, like you know, you honorary right degree? You've, 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 I'll give <laughs> like you the, right I'll here you the end certificate of this. later. Wow, my whole life just changed. <laughs> right um, here live. Okay, but yeah. for right now, I'm going to bring some more issues, okay? okay. <laughs> so I've been working a lot 
around this concept of release. Yeah. And it's not as simple as just sitting down and saying, I'm choosing to release this person. It really has to be a paradigm shift of acceptance. Like oh. I'm accepting that I am releasing this person. That's really hard when somebody has caused you a tremendous amount of pain. Mm -hmm. And when somebody has done something to you that altered your life, like it's not even possible now for life to go back to the way it was. You've got to learn to move forward into a new normal, a new yeah. reality. But this releasing is complicated. Very much. And so one thing that's helped me from a theological standpoint is realizing that I'm not releasing this person as in saying, it doesn't matter what happened. That's yeah. not what I'm saying, because right. it very much mattered. I'm not releasing this person saying that, okay, what you did wasn't so bad, because in a lot of cases, it was really bad, right? But what I'm learning to do is release this person to God, right. because God says that vengeance is his. Mm -hmm. And part of my resistance to releasing is that I want to know, is this person ever going to realize the impact that they created? Is this person ever going to realize that their actions didn't just affect themselves, but it had a tremendous effect on all the people around them trying to do life with them. And so when I started to pursue like, okay, this release for me is going to be me releasing this person to God. It wasn't even so much that I want God to take vengeance on them. Right. It was that I want them to realize, I want them to have that moment of sorrow that what they did was wrong and that they shouldn't have done it. Mm. And it's hard for me to release until I feel like some justice is there. And what God has been teaching me is when someone else sins against us, no matter if we ever see it or not, sin always comes as a package deal with consequences. If we go all the way back to Genesis, it's very apparent that when Adam and Eve sinned, consequences were naturally unleashed in their life because sin has two parts to it. Mm -hmm. It has what enticed you in the first place, which looks like, wow, this is going to be fun. This is going to be new. This is going to be, you know, whatever. This is It gonna... is enjoyable for a season. The Bible mm -hmm. says that. Mm -hmm. part of so action. it's got that part to it. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember it also comes with a package deal with consequences. And so I don't have to see the other person's um, consequences to know that they existed. And the consequences are for the purpose of bringing them to natural repentance and sorrow. They may never get to the repentance and sorrow. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're dealing with someone who is absolutely refusing to learn from what they yeah. did, mm -hmm. but they will absolutely suffer the consequences of their choices because that consequence was built into the sin. That has helped me release. That has helped me to feel like there is some sort of justice here. I don't have to go after it. I don't have to peel back the curtain and see it for myself. I just can stand confidently and quietly knowing that that person chose to do something sinful and there were consequences built in. And that has made it easier for me to release them to the Lord. Mm, that's so good. I, I'm at the risk of being a little clever here. Uh, and this just came to me, it's how my brain works. Um, I like that you're in a season of release because some of us who know you every now and then, we won't say Lisa, we'll say Lise. Mm -hmm. And you're re-lease, your name, reclaiming mm -hmm. your life as Lisa going forward in a new normal. And then the idea of, I'm gonna borrow another one, of releasing, like you're leasing a part of your life, you're leasing the next part of your life, and I'm redoing that to claim and re-lease, re-own where I'm going forward. A lot of us have given up ownership in toxic relationships, which is another program we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And I've lost myself. We've said codependent people often don't have a me that they know of. I'm so managing everybody mm -hmm. else and all that. But to be able to sit and say, I want to release that and let it go and re dash lease this new part of my mm -hmm. life and take ownership to go forward. It's a new day and you don't need anybody else to co-sign that. You can have advisors around you, mm -hmm. trusted friends who say, this is what I've got to do. Um, I, I my markers here, right? For for really these signs or, or road signs like going up an interstate of healing. 
uh, am I still obsessing over the trauma done to me? It's the right word, just playing it over and over. Remember, neurochemically in your brain, that's going to fire dopamine. That's going to feel really good to obsess. And it's going to be numbing and medicating it. Sometimes, again, we referred to this last time as I could be shopping for pain. Don't make that innocuous because, again, I'm firing a lot of numbing chemicals in my brain or searching for safety. And, and sometimes I say it this way. It's just the way I do it. If you try to make sanity out of another person's insanity, you'll go insane. Mm -hmm. But you try to name it and say, but look what they did. And, and somehow I got to figure it out. No, it is what it is. Huh. It's insane. It's unhealthy. It's sin. It's how did Solomon at the end of his life in 1 Kings 9, 10, 11 do the stuff he did? It's all been done before, right? So the idea is saying, I don't want to try to make sanity out of a person's insanity. I think when you talk about obsessing over something, yeah. it, for some people, myself included, yeah. it is trying to figure out why this happened so that it won't happen again. Notice the control, the prediction of the future, mm -hmm. so that it won't happen mm -hmm. again. But I wonder if really a stage of healing is choosing instead of trying to figure out what happened so it won't happen again, instead me making my thoughts, turning that energy of my thoughts around what now? Like what do I need to know now to make better choices or to engage with better relationships in the future or to um, use this as an opportunity to do some self-reflection and become a healthier version of me. So what you're saying is the releasing is you can know that you're healing when you're releasing and you can know that you're healing when instead of obsessing about what happened, mm -hmm. maybe you're progressing Good towards something better. And thinking about appropriately yourself and what do I need to do here? What would God not, what's God trying to teach me? Think about what is God wanting to do in me during this time, C.S. Lewis would say in Narnia, he would want to take you further up and further in. God, what are you wanting to do with me and in me during this time? Now mm -hmm. I'm focused on me and what God is wanting to do in me versus what that other person did. And why was I back there? It's all this stuff back in the past. The past is over. So good. It's over. So two footnotes. Uh, you know, the academic says the footnotes uh, analogy. One is, at least when you're talking about the release, um, uh, really another word for that is forgiveness. That is exactly mm -hmm. what we're talking about. And you wrote a book about it, an entire biblical theology, forgiving what you can't forget. And the two words there in Greek are afiami, which is a, a forensic release. It's a canceling of the debt. But the other one is very unique. And it's Paul's uh, word that he uses. And he kind of, Paul's known for making words up. He's, you know, a man after my own heart in that sense. And he's got a word called charizomai. It comes from two Greek words, charis, which means grace, and zomai, which is a compound word that leads to for forgiveness. It is a gracious forgiveness. Now, here's the issue that rubs me the wrong way. And I think any justice seekers <laughs> out there, yes. it's going to rub them the wrong way. Because what that means is there's no conditional clause. A charizomai type of forgiveness doesn't come with a conditional clause of, well, they asked for repentance, well, they've done all the right things. No, because why? If you don't do the, the gracious release that's required of us, we're bound in the prison of our own pain. And that is an unfair added trauma we talked about in the last episode, an unfair trauma to put ourselves in. The second thing that you've just talked about here in Paul's language, this is Romans 8, um, it's, it's setting my, our mind not on things of the flesh, but on things of the spirit. Now, what happens when we set our mind on things of the spirit? This is the end of verse uh, 7. Um, and sorry, where are you at, Joel? Give Romans the reference. 8, Romans 8, verse 6. It says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Love it. Mm -hmm. And that phrase, set your mind, it's talking about having a guardrail for your mind. It's about not letting it run rampant, but setting up guardrails to guide you and to direct you uh, in the way that you're supposed to go. And that's- It's kind of like when I, I love to take kids bowling, <laughs> because they put up those guardrails. That's right. The so bumpers. You cannot get yeah into the gutter, that is 
such a fun way to bowl, that right? Mm -hmm. And so, Joel, how do we set up guardrails? So because good. basically what that means is our thoughts are coming down just like the ball comes down toward the pins, right? Mm -hmm. And so our thoughts are coming down. And so what are, what are some examples, and Jim, I'd love your thoughts too. Yeah. Like, what are some examples of guardrails to help us do that so that we really cannot set our mind on things of the flesh that lead to death? but set our minds on, on things above and, and on things of Christ that then can help us find that path of life and peace. Because I can find my thoughts running rampant when I am in the process of healing. Yeah, so I would reverse engineer this and start with, well, what is the outcome of setting your mind on the spirit. The, the word there is life and peace. And so we had a Bible study, Lisa and I, we get to do a Bible study on Wednesdays. One of my favorite early morning Bible studies that we get to do. Um, and in one of the sessions we talked about, when you walk into a conversation, if you walk into a conversation with a friend and you walk in with peace, but you leave without peace, well, some guardrails need to go up. Yeah. Wow, Some okay. Some conversations need to be had. Because you you entered in a in a posture of shalom peace and you and you left in a posture of chaos and so one of the first things I think that we need to ask ourselves um, are how do we set our minds well what are the things in our life that establish peace in our lives what are the relationships that pursue peace in our lives and what are those things that don't so this is again and we're going to talk about this later on with boundaries but sometimes it means that we're going to say yes to some relationships oh. and some relationships we have to say no to wow. and so setting our mind um, is not just framing but doing uh, and having that ability to do the other thing i think of is the fruit of the spirit love joy mm -hmm. peace patience kindness good i mean you know all this in bible school and vacation bible school we memorize mm -hmm. that um, do we enter in and leave our relationships with those things? How do we, um, I think about this in my family, in my relationship with my kids. Uh, how do I set up systems and structures in the morning? Because I'm not a morning person, y'all. You need to know this right off the bat. Like the most amazing theologians all got up at like 3 a.m. Joel ain't getting up at 3 a.m. You're not I even going to bed by 3 a.m. I'm probably you? still reading at 3 a.m., you know? Um, and so I have had to think about very like, okay, what what are the, the systems that need to be set up in order to, to show love to my children in the morning? Kindness, um, compassion, all of those types of things. And it's simple. It's simple things like, hey, boys, at night, um, it's really, really important that your bag is put together at night so we're not scrambling in the morning. Yeah. If this is a type of guardrail that we're putting up that is, is saving our sanity and our peace. And I think for me, I have to be careful, not just the people and the boundaries that we may need to set in order to set the stage for peace. Um, I also have to make personal choices of what is affecting my thought life. And so, you know, if I'm watching something and it makes me suddenly feel like it intensifies my loneliness. Right. Well, then that's probably not the wisest thing for me to watch. It's pretty simple. And um, or even social media. Like if I if I find myself saying, "Wow, when I engage with this first thing in the morning, then that's consuming my thoughts." That's probably not the wisest way to spend my first thoughts in the morning. Yeah. And I know from doing research on the brain that when we wake up in the morning that whatever we put our mind to first will often saturate us so deeply and mm -hmm. often start to dictate how we perceive everything through that day. And cortisol levels, the stress mm -hmm. hormone, are highest in the morning. So people have this morning anxiety. And if you exacerbate that by doing what you just said, biologically, the court we've slept, the cortisol levels are highest in the morning, the stress hormone. Mm. So feed that, you've already got the body like you need to, when you wake up, get up. When you get up, wake up. You need blanket victory, like get out of the bed. People are scrolling, not realizing that that's a bad time and place to be doing things that are not healthy. If so you're Jim, what shopping I'm hearing you pain. say is that I'm no longer supposed to wake up in the morning with my kids yeah. for my cortisone levels. <laughs> 
Yeah. Is that a like writ? Can you write that down so I can take that home? With I you? think you are supposed to wake up with your kids. You're supposed to get plenty of sleep the night before. Oh, okay. that needs to be a guardrail so that when you wake up with your kids in the morning, the backpacks are set and That's you right. reduce the stress That's and right. you're kind. That's you right. set yourself over that. I didn't even say a thing, but she took over and said, "Listen, <laughs> there you go." She earned but it, it reminds me a little bit of Philippians chapter four, verse mm -hmm. starting in verse eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And so I think those are some good guardrails as well. 